Well, again, happy Father's Day. And it's uh, wonderful to see some fathers who have come and some children who have come to bless their fathers and their parents. Uh, every study that comes out these days shows the importance of fathers uh, in the home and the way that they parent their children. So thank you for all the efforts that you make. It holds and glues whole communities together. It's enormously important. <clears throat> we are also um, uh, mourning, particularly as a church, with one father uh, whose uh, daughter was lost to stillbirth this week. We have been um, weeping and heavy in spirit for uh, Rachel and Josiah Kohlmeyer. Uh, as you've heard, that service will be this afternoon, uh, and just wanted to let you know they've asked to have it in the chapel because uh, they didn't want to face a room this large, uh, and they're not going to be able to speak to anyone. They're going to come in and go out, uh, so things will be very tight. Um, I don't want you to be offended if you should arrive and it's full. Um, that's just the way that they've asked for it to be, so, uh, but do be in prayer. I know our church has been in great prayerful solidarity with them in this um, really sad loss. Well, we turn our attention to God's Word, and we're going to take a look at um, what is the power that drives things underneath the external events. Uh, that's all in chapter 6 of Joshua. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to do His work. Blessed Holy Spirit, we thank you that you delight to shine light upon the Son who gives glory to the Father, and for that wonderful triune circle of love we thank you that that circle has opened out to include us, to invite us out of ourselves and into that transcendent grace. And we thank you that every moment you offer us that ladder up, the ladder of your word, but we need your assistance to climb up, to consecrate our hearts downward that our souls might climb up to you. Would you do that now as your word is read and proclaimed? In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> So the people of God were returning to the land that had been taken from them after they'd been enslaved in Egypt, and they had crossed the Jordan River, and they were getting ready to wage war. The people of Jericho were walled up inside and were afraid. Here was the new battle plan. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out, none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, see I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and its mighty men of valor. Now you shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Now seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Covenant. And on the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before them. I don't know how in the world that worked, because the secret things belong to the Lord our God. <clears throat> that we may do all the words of this law. Well, once again, we're confronted with rather bizarre military strategy. Last week, we saw that after they'd crossed the Jordan and the people of Jericho were fearfully anticipating their arrival, the people paused for at least a week while the warriors were circumcised and the Passover feast was kept and their great commander fell on his face before a mysterious man with a sword. Well, it gets even stranger. The Lord decided that the plan of attack would go this way. The next day, they were to gather the warriors, and they were to surround a group of priests with seven trumpets, and behind them a group of priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, that sacred symbol of the Lord I Am's presence in their midst. And they were to say not a word, but simply march around the circumference of the city and let the horns be blown. That's it, day one. Day two, same thing. All you warriors, get up there. Don't open your mouths. Surround the trumpets and the ark. March all the way around. Go back home. And so it continued until the seventh day when they were to march around blowing the trumpets seven times. How eerie that must have been for the people of Jericho peeping through their walls, wondering 
How strange that they didn't shoot arrows down from the walls or throw tar on them. All the time, a spiritual grip was tightening around the city. With every circling of God's people blowing the trumpets of praise to the Lord I am, the spiritual grip was getting tighter and tighter. Until after the seventh trip, on the seventh day, they shouted and the walls came tumbling down. What happened? The power of God enacted through the obedient actions of a worshiping people brought down the walls. Now, if this hadn't happened, you never would have recorded it this way. If Israel had taken Jericho by close fighting, if you'd lost brothers in arms, if you'd been part of a long siege, if you'd fought on the ramparts, fought and bled, if you'd had a mighty military victory, somebody would have made sure that was recorded. Commanders who survive battles want people to know about their warriors. But in this story, all credit goes to the Lord I am. It was a spiritual power enacted through the obedient worshiping community that brought down the walls of Jericho. That's the whole point in the story. That is the biblical principle. But we're going to spend the rest of our time today looking at its application. What happens when an obedient people is able to enact the power of God in a country or a culture? In Ephesians 6, Paul said, for our struggle, our contest, is not actually against flesh and blood. It's against the spiritual forces of darkness in the present age. We wrestle with the authorities of wickedness. In other words, every human attempt to strive for the good, the true, and the beautiful is going to be met with resistance. It has an external form. But what matters more is the spiritual contest that's occurring underneath. It's the spiritual warfare that makes all the difference in the achievement of the external goals. Now, most of us didn't grow up thinking this way. It's not normal to our way of thinking that spiritual warfare is going on all around us. In many respects, it's because most of us grew up in this country in which the collective faith of millions and millions of people was channeling the power of the Spirit of God and it didn't feel like there was spiritual warfare. Even non-believers understood that as a culture we lived our lives with reference to someone who created us and to whom we are accountable. It provided a national internal moral compass. It directed us even if we weren't active believers. It was the atmosphere in which we lived. It's changed subtly. In fact, you are almost going to be astounded how much that was true not that long ago, even within the lifetimes of some of us. I was pleasantly astounded by reading an article two weeks ago was the 78th anniversary of D-Day. You remember in World War II, there was an invasion. 156,000 Allied troops surprised the Germans by landing on the beaches of Normandy. It was the largest military invasion to date in history and one of the bloodiest battles ever fought over many days. It broke the spine of the Nazi army and turned the tide of the war. Well, the night of the invasion, President Roosevelt went on the radio to address the nation. He said very little. Most of his address was a 524 word prayer, which he himself had written. I wanna read you some excerpts. He prayed, and so in this poignant hour, I ask you to join with me in prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor to struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. They will be sore tried, 
by night and by day without rest until the victory is won. Men's souls will be shaken by the violences of war. For these men are only lately drawn from the ways of peace. They fight not for the lust of conquest. They fight to end conquest. They fight to liberate. They yearn but for the end of battle. So, O oh Lord, give us faith. Faith in thee. Faith in our sons. Faith in each other. Faith in our united crusade. Help us to conquer the apostles of greed and racial arrogancies. Lead us to the saving of our country and into a peace that will let all men live in freedom, reaping the just rewards of their honest toil. At the president's request, the nation went to prayer. All over the country the next day, in the middle of the week, churches were opened and they were packed. The New York Times opinion page was full of people calling the nation to prayer. We all agreed, believers and unbelievers of all faiths alike, this is the time to call on someone higher than ourselves. It wasn't that long ago. The President of the United States praying an intricate and coherent prayer on behalf of the nation and the nation responding. It felt like cool water on a hot day to read that. It's like, I'm not crazy. We used to be different. We used to have God in the midst of our national conversation and it united us. So what happened? How do we cease having God at the heart of our conversations? How does that occur? Well, maybe to think about that, we could turn to another story. To one of C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. You know those books. If you haven't read them, you have a great treat awaiting you. Seven stories for children about a land called Narnia, where the animals talk and the air is clearer and the colors are more vivid and magic happens all the time. Narnia is ruled by the great lion Aslan, who appears from time to time. He's clearly meant to be a figure for Jesus Christ. And in the story, some ordinary British school children, refugees from the bombing in London during World War II, are routinely transported into Narnia, where though they were ordinary in this world, they are extraordinary in Narnia and have great adventures to undergo. Well, in the silver chair, two English school children have entered Narnia and joined up with a creature called a marsh wiggle, Puddle Glum by name, and it's all in the name. He was, to borrow from another story, a kind of an Eeyore always seeing the low side of things. And their quest was to go and liberate Prince Rillian. The kingdom depended on Prince Rillian being freed from the clutches of the evil green lady. She had him trapped in her underground realm, kept in a dank, dark room whose only light was a fireplace and a dim lamp. Well, as the story goes on, the children find Rillian and they're able to hack him out of his bonds, free him from the silver chair, and they're about to escape when the green lady returns and confronts them. And she immediately takes some dust and throws it into the fire. And this dust is meant to weave an enchantment, a spell. Immediately they're getting drowsy and confused. They can't remember where they are or why they are there. She begins to speak to them, to tell them, what is all this talk about Narnia and a world above this world? What is all this talk about a son? That's baby talk. That's what children make up. You base it on seeing that there's a lamp in this room and you imagine this silly idea that there's sky, something called sky that is blue. You're living in a fantasy world. There is no other world but mine. This is the real world. This is where adults live with this lamp in this room. There is no Narnia. And the children are forgetting where they came from, forgetting what they've seen. They're tumbling under the enchantment when finally the purpose of the marsh wiggle is revealed. Puddle Glum walks slowly with great effort over to the fire and stamps his great foot onto the flames, burning his foot 
but putting out the fire and awakening him from the spell. The children's minds begin to clear. Puddleglum goes over to the witch and he speaks to her. Listen to what he said. One word, ma'am, he said, coming back from the fire, limping because of the pain. One word, all you've been saying is quite right. I shouldn't wonder. I'm a chap, after all, who always liked to know the worst. So I won't deny any of what you said. But there's one more thing to be said, even so. Suppose we have only dreamed or made up all those things. Trees and grass and sun and moon and stars and Aslan himself. Suppose we have. Then all I can say is that in that case, the made up things seem a good deal more interesting than the real things. Suppose this black pit of a kingdom of yours is the only world. Well, it strikes me as a pretty poor world. And that's the funny thing when you come to think of it. We're just babies making up a game if you're right. But four babies making up a play world can create a world that licks your real world hollow. That's why I'm going to stand by the play world. I'm on Aslan's side, even if there isn't any Aslan. I'm going to live like I'm from Narnia, even if there isn't any Narnia. Suppose this black pit of a kingdom that you say is actually the only world, and we're just babies making up a game. So why is it that four babies making up a game can create a play world that licks your real world hollow? Puddleglum made a confession of faith. He spoke belief against all evidence to his senses, to the contrary, and the spell snapped, and the children came awake. And then, with the spell broken, and Lewis is so brilliant here, then they were able to fight the enraged witch. Then they could engage the battle, because you see, it's always two stages. Break the spell with truth, so you can engage the fight for freedom. Two stages. We have the highest vision for humanity's future ever uttered on the face of the earth. We have a gospel that accounts realistically for the sorrow and the death and the disaster in the world and resolves it at a deeper, greater level than any story or philosophy ever told. We have a gospel to proclaim. But what has happened to us? The green lady's spell is strong. Shortly after the end of that World War II, Roosevelt prayed us through. Prosperity rose. Our place in the world rose to an unparalleled height. And our vigilance failed. Good Christians began to be enchanted by all the prosperity our nation was creating. We believed we could have all the prosperity we wanted to the neglect of Christ's mission. We pursued bright, shiny objects instead of going deeper into the truth. We indulged a fantasy that we could create the great society and fix the world by our own prosperity and smarts and efforts. We became bedazzled by our technology. And though we gave lip service to Christ as master, we were enchanted with the idea that we could be masters of our own lives. Self-expression overruled self-sacrifice. Freedom of self overruled duty to God and others. We were enchanted Good Christians, let our vigilance slip. We were enamored with a fantasy of consumerism and self-expression. Therefore, all the time it was brewing, we didn't see it. The rise of a cultural Marxism that now is an alternate religion. It captures our young people 
and tells us everything we thought our country was built on is a lie. Every good thing we've done is tainted with evil and it should all be dismantled. What should be put in its place is not quite so specific. But we walk around guilty and not sure what to do and we are at each other's throats. The media outlets that we love pit us against the media outlets that other people love. We are tribalized and angry and God is absolutely suppressed in our conversation. When's the last time you mentioned the name of God in a conversation with someone who wasn't from your church? It's evaporated. That happens even among good conservatives. We need to break the spell. It's time to stamp on the fire, even if it's painful, to clear our heads, to come awake to God's reality. We're not self-generated. We're not accountable to no one but ourselves. That's a lie. God made us. He intended us for love and joy, and we are accountable to him. It's hard to come awake to that. Hard to break the spell. The green lady weaves a good tale. But we have a secret weapon. Several secret weapons. The worship of the church is a spell breaker. You know how you come in here in the morning? I don't even want to go. I got so much to do. I'm so distracted. It's so boring. I don't even like these people. You come in here and your hearts are lifted up into the worship and story of God. And you realize, I love these people. This is where I want to be. And I see a higher, better story. And my life has changed. We have a spell breaker. It's the word of God, God's word written that is a ladder out of self and into the one true story that heals and redeems. But you got to partake, got to use the weapons. We have the weapon of prayer, the weapon of sacrament, the sword of truth. So I'd like to maybe try to show you this is true if God's spirit is faithful to his word. I want to walk you through a cascade of scriptures that are spell breakers. I want to see walls come tumbling down by the word of God delivered with almost no comment. Let the truth wash through you, brace you, disturb you, restore you, and heal you. Ready? In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let us make man in our image. So in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And God said to them, on the day you eat of this forbidden fruit, you will surely die. But the serpent said, you will surely not die. For God knows that when you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be opened and you shall be like God. So the prophet Isaiah said, therefore you felt secure in your wickedness. You said, no one sees me. And you said in your heart, I am and there is none besides me. But now disaster will fall upon you. For the wicked boast of the desires of his soul. The one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek God. All his thoughts are, no, there's no God. So you were weary with the length of your way. But still you will not say, it is hopeless. Turn to me then and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, there's no other. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. So come everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters. And he who has no money, come anyway, buy and eat. Why do you keep spending your money on that which does not satisfy no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. 
Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him now while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. The unrighteous man his faults. Let us return to the Lord, for he will have compassion on us. Our God will abundantly pardon. Repent, therefore, turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. For there is no other name given under heaven by which men can be saved. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We have a gospel to proclaim. We are summoned to learn the story, to rehearse it constantly, and to speak it as a spellbreaker into the world. We're called to risk saying, that's just not true. This is true. We are called to take the name of Jesus on our lips and return God to our discourse, not in an angry, excluding way, but in a welcoming, loving way to raise the heights and sights of those around us to a deeper, more wonderful reality. The walls of Jericho came down when God's power worked and was enacted through a faithful, obedient, worshiping community. Let's speak the truth that the world might live. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for all that you have called us to. We thank you that we do not belong to ourselves, but to you. And for so great a gospel, set it singing on our lips for your sake in the world. Amen.